Last week, the President of France made a political atomic bomb announcement. At the recent International Support Conference for Ukraine, French President Emmanuel Macron did not rule out the possibility that France, and by extension NATO, could deploy troops on Ukrainian territory to fight against Russia, although he acknowledged that there was no consensus on this issue. This statement sent shockwaves all the way to Moscow, which decided to respond with strong statements. Macron's ambiguity about the possibility of NATO troops being deployed in Ukraine raises a disturbing question. Are we on the verge of a direct military escalation between NATO and Russia in Ukraine? But what would you say if I told you that there are French and British troops in Ukraine? Just as you heard, France's statements caused a diplomatic crisis in Germany, where Chancellor Olaf Scholz quickly came out to declare and say that his country would not send German troops to Ukraine, and as the saying goes, he blurted out when speaking too much. The German Chancellor confirmed that there are French and British troops in Ukraine, not at the front as such, but helping Ukraine to program and digest the attacks of the French and British missiles. Macron's words caused a real earthquake in Europe, provoking the fury of Paris and London over Berlin for revealing the presence of troops from these countries in Ukraine. At the same time, the White House also quickly declared that no American soldier would be deployed to the Ukrainian front. Now, why did Macron dare to make such strong statements at the support conference for Ukraine? Remember that both France and Russia are nuclear powers. Is Macron really taking into account the seriousness of his words? Under what conditions could a hypothetical NATO intervention in Ukraine occur? Would NATO really allow Ukraine to collapse in case of an eventual defeat against Russia? That's what we're going to see today. Let's begin. Two years since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and with Russia gaining momentum again in Ukraine, Macron's statements seem to be more than mere rhetoric. The potential escalation of sending Western troops to fight against the Russians in Ukraine by France and possibly other NATO members could be interpreted as a measure of deterrence or strategic mediation. This possibility comes at a time when Ukrainian forces are retreating in various parts of the front against a Russia seemingly determined to continue, as President Putin affirmed in his speech on February 29th. The analysis of the situation suggests that France wants to set new limits or red lines to the war in Ukraine, potentially with the support of troops on the ground to avoid a Ukrainian collapse. This is a 180 degree shift from France's initial stance when the invasion began two years ago. Now that NATO has expanded with the inclusion of Finland and Sweden, not only does the number of troops in the military alliance increase, but also the naval, air, and land capabilities of the bloc improve. This strengthening of NATO could theoretically tip the balance in favor of Ukraine raising the question of whether a conventional war against Russia on the ground could be won. But this is such a delicate issue that more than half of the countries that left the Paris conference, including the USA, came out to affirm they would not send troops. NATO's support for Ukraine has become a fundamental pillar in resisting the Russian invasion, but when it comes to sending their own soldiers from member countries to die, for a non-NATO country, that is another matter. We already know that it was France who organized this support conference for Ukraine, and indeed, it was France itself that would have proposed behind closed doors to the other NATO countries that the time has come, the time for NATO to also bear the dead. Moving forward, we will explore why France proposed this, what the real intentions and consequences are. If hypothetically NATO were to enter could they expel the Russians from Ukraine? Thanks to NATO, the recent inclusion of Finland and Sweden into the bloc not only symbolizes a significant expansion in NATO's political sense, but also considerably strengthens NATO's military potential, especially thanks to Finland. This enhancement, ranging from an increase in troop numbers to improved capabilities in air, naval, and land domains, 
theoretically suggests that NATO could have a very favorable chance of altering the conflict's course in favor of Ukraine. What NATO has done so far is important, namely the delivery of weapons, tanks, missiles, ammunition, and everything so that Ukrainians can resist. One does not have to be a mathematician or pro-West to know that 32 countries could easily turn the conflict in Ukraine around. However, there's a problem. NATO so far has fought wars and intervened in civil conflicts of limited capacity. For example, in NATO's last intervention in Libya, even France and the United Kingdom had to ask the United States for help by bombing Gaddafi's positions. And that was without putting a single boot on the ground. It's a completely different thing for NATO as an organization to fight on another terrain against a military power. We agree that Russia has not been the super army that was going to take Kyiv in three days, but neither can the Russian army be completely underestimated. Moreover, we must make an important distinction between NATO and the European Union. Let's look at this graph, which is a faithful representation of the enormous weight of the United States in NATO. Clearly, with NATO, with the United States on the ground, NATO would give Russia a run for its money in Ukraine, but remove the United States and leave only the European states, and the situation changes. The same European intelligence sources say that the European countries have just three or four days of artillery reserves to face a total war in Europe. Denmark recently sent all its artillery to Ukraine, literally running out of their own bullets to fight themselves. That's precisely why Macron has requested that the entire European Union activate a war economy to produce weapons massively, not only to help Ukraine, but even for their own security. NATO's strategy has drastically evolved from the early days of the conflict. Initially, Joe Biden, like Macron, had said that sending war tanks, planes, and missiles would mean a third world war against Russia. Now, two years later, it seems that Western countries have lost their fear of those supposed Russian red lines. There's only one element theoretically missing to cross the last red line, and that is effectively Western troops fighting Russian troops in Ukraine. There was certain apprehension within the alliance about crossing certain red lines that could be interpreted as direct participation in the war, especially regarding the supply of advanced weaponry like fighter jets, tanks, and long-range missiles. But now the situation has changed dramatically. What was once unthinkable has now become a reality, with NATO sending significantly more advanced military equipment to Ukraine. And not only that, as revealed by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, French and British troops are already present on Ukrainian territory to help Ukraine launch long-range cruise missiles of Franco-British origin to strike Russian military infrastructure. One of the latest examples was the bombing of the Russian Black Sea Fleet's headquarters in Sevastopol, Crimea, which was precisely destroyed thanks to the British Storm Shadow missiles. However, this revelation just caused a strong diplomatic impasse between France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. London was very upset with the German Chancellor's statements, considering them impertinent and a leak of information from a key NATO ally. Germany thus publicly distances itself from France, stating it does not plan to send any German soldiers to Ukraine. Recently, the German parliament also rejected the delivery of long-range Taurus missiles of German origin, which, in theory, would give Ukraine the ability to destroy the Kerch Bridge, Vladimir Putin's multi-billion dollar bridge that links Crimea to mainland Russia. But the direct involvement of NATO, or a part of it, would entail significant risks. And here, a real red line could indeed be crossed. Russia's red lines and NATO. During the first months of the war, there was a noticeable fear within NATO about sending fighter jets, tanks, and long-range missiles to Ukraine, fearing that such actions could be interpreted as direct participation in the conflict. Today, there are already Western tanks 
planes and long-range missiles participating in the war. The only thing missing is troops, and that would be precisely what is needed to complete the set. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has already revealed that French and British troops are on Ukrainian soil, but these troops are not directly facing the Russians on the battlefield or the Ukrainian front, but rather engaging in logistical support and intelligence tasks. We can almost take for granted that there will not be NATO troops collectively fighting against Russian troops on the Ukrainian front because that would require the approval of all members and many countries would oppose. However, hypothetically, some countries like France and the United Kingdom could say, well, I'm going to send my soldiers to fight the Russians in Ukraine to prevent the Ukrainian collapse. The question then focuses on whether these countries are crossing a red line that could lead to an even greater escalation of the conflict. The hypothetical moment when Ukrainian forces, along with French forces or those from any country deciding to intervene, begin to significantly push back the Russians, Putin might consider that a red line has now been crossed. Indeed, one of those red lines would be Crimea. The potential recovery of territories like Crimea, especially with the military assistance of troops from third countries on the ground, raises even more questions about the scope and objectives of an intervention by France or NATO. Russia's response to a significant advance by NATO or third country troops could range from a conventional escalation to the use of asymmetric tactics or even a tactical nuclear weapon. But at the same time, NATO has invested so much money and effort in Ukraine that it encourages the alliance to do whatever it takes to prevent. Conclusions. In conclusion, the recent statements by French President Emmanuel Macron regarding the possibility of a NATO troop deployment in Ukraine have marked a more serious point in the war. As NATO increases its support for Ukraine, it faces a series of dilemmas, balancing the desire to stop Russian aggression with the risk of provoking an escalation that could lead to direct confrontation. Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons is not new, but the possibility of NATO or third country troops on Ukrainian soil fighting against Russian troops is, so we really won't know what Putin's response could be in order to avoid it at all costs. Now the question is for you. Do you think it is a good idea to send troops from France, another country, or NATO to expel the Russians from Ukraine?